Approaching relationships with investors, what can founders do to reduce friction with investors? Reducing friction with investors, yeah. I would say, well, I think, I think a lot of it comes down to transparency, mm -hmm. honesty, and making sure, you know, I think a mistake I see quite a few people make, I've certainly made it from time to time as well, is dealing with investors at, at, only at the board meeting cycle. You know, if you're only chatting to them every quarter or every month or whatever, the interaction is not so fluent. So I think having some openness and transparency and trying to update them more often than just the board meeting, try and yeah. bring them a bit more on the inside. Yeah. What about you? Anything worked or not worked for you? I think transparency is a big one. I think if you've got, if you have problems that you're hiding from them, they're only gonna be worse by the time you have to come around to explaining them. Yeah. And if you take them on the journey of fixing them, they're also gonna have more belief that you, you are on top of things. Someone said to me that you should treat investors like people you already know you're gonna ask them a massive favor in the future. <laughs> <laughs> like when you need another five million pounds. Um, I thought that was good advice. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think try and talk to them regularly and be transparent is definitely yeah. how I think we've been successful with our investor base. When managing spend, mm. how can founders be better at making use of technological advancements? I think kind of being better at it, give it a go, right? Yeah. Ha have a go at it. Yeah. Find out what are the products that are on the market, which fit in, and don't be afraid to trial them. Um, it's definitely, even as, you know, I think most of us in tech are early adopters, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. typically. But it, it is still easy to get a bit stuck in your ways, you know, and not try and experiment with new things that are out there. So I guess trying to be a bit open-minded and try these new things that are coming along, yeah. give them a go. Yeah, I think, think don't don't trust the accountants. <laughs> <laughs> As yeah. in, they're always incredibly conservative of what you can be using or doing. If you are running your financials on what your accountants recommend, it's always going to be like five, ten years behind. I think what you can achieve if you embrace. Not that we have we have great accountants, but like I think if you want to push forward what technology you're using, it's going to be driven by the startup, not by the existing methodologies yeah exactly because they're really far behind in the sales yeah. cycle yeah. is raising money easier than knowing how to spend it I think it depends on where you are as a company so in the early days you're much better at raising money off mm. a vision and yeah. I think you can get money off investors more easily but then you don't really know how to spend it because you've never properly fundraised before or you just are at early stage and you're trying lots of stuff I think when you get to a later stage of a business, you're much better at knowing how to spend it. There's a lot more scrutiny attached to getting the capital of investors. In many ways, raising is easier than spending because you have less options. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at just what are all the choices you can make, you know, raising money is pretty straightforward. You go find an investor who's the right level for you, you pitch them on a vision, you yeah, have a business yeah. case to back it up and things fall into place. Whereas spending it, there's almost an infinite number of things you can spend on, right? Yeah. And particularly first time round, that's pretty puzzling. You know, how much should I be spending on marketing versus development? Yeah. Should I even be spending this? You know, what's too much yeah, to be yeah, spending yeah. in this particular yeah. thing? I think you can be shy about spending in the early days as yes. well. You know, yeah. you're like, how oh, should I spend 10 grand? And you're like, 10 grand, that's crazy. We can't spend 10 grand on that. Yeah. And then you later down the line, you realize that actually, no, you should definitely be spending that money. Like you've been given it to spend it. When should founders think about handing over day-to-day -day financial oversight and why? It's really as soon as possible. My overall philosophy as a founder is to try and hand over day-to-day -day ownership of everything as soon as possible so yeah. that you can always move on to the next thing, the next big question. With finance, really getting somebody in at either like a controller or a financial director level who has the capacity to develop into a CFO, yeah. that's going to give you as the founder time to work on the things you really want to. We've probably held on to financials for a bit too long at the yeah. start, you know, kind of bootstrapping it around and not necessarily realizing the advantage you could leverage out of it. Yeah. You know, so you can see financials as just like something you have to do to submit to HMRC. Yeah. I think done well, they bring data and stuff that you can act upon and more insight into how your business is performing than you think. And I think there's a lot more in there, like if you get a good CFO, yeah. that you can get advantages from being on top of that data, which if you're just submitting it, if you're just treating it as a bookkeeping exercise, you don't get anything from it. 
what spending mistakes can founders make after raising a lot of money? I actually think probably the number one mistake is not uh, is not spending the money. Like you rarely see a credible startup raise money and then go and blow it all on a party or anything. Like, you know, <laughs> maybe in Silicon Valley, I don't know, but I've, I've rarely seen startups doing that. Whereas I think a lot of startups struggle to convince themselves to spend it mm. in situations where spending it would really help. Yeah. Like, you know, if you need to get someone great on the team, hire a headhunter. Yeah. Yes, it will cost yeah. you 20 grand, 30 grand. You'll get the person you need on your leadership team rather than you spending months trying to find that person. And I think people who've only just raised a first round are often too shy to spend it, not spend too much of it extravagantly. Yeah, agree. It's like a case of that getting out of the bootstrapping mindset where you're yeah. trying to save everything and you're a small group of people to the mode where you're trying to deploy your finances, deploy your cash in a way that grows your business. Yeah. Finding those engines and growth. After Series A, we definitely spent money in the wrong areas. Mm -hmm. We discovered we were spending in the wrong areas and we course corrected, but I would have loved to have discovered it even even sooner. Yeah. Right? And that's, yeah. that's the challenge, right? It's what are the engines of growth going to be? What are the areas, the bets I need to place? But how can I test and learn and validate to make sure my assumption is the right one? Yeah, yeah. As founders, what drives your financial decisions? I guess the business decisions now, in some ways, is quite simple. I mean, from where, where we look at it now, we're looking at um, a sort of five to seven year return on investment period. We then look at some, in some of the variable spend, something like product roadmap spend, what are the product areas and technology R&D that we need to invest in to generate that ROI, the return on investment over a seven year period. Mm -hmm. So it's really quite a classic ROI analysis yeah, looking yeah. at that. I think for me what drives the financial decisions we make is like a bit more intangible. We're much more early stage than you. Yeah. So like, you know, we're thinking more of the runway we need or the MRR we need by the end of this funding round to yeah. make sure we get a series B. So I think we don't you know, we're not a big enough business that we're actually making that many financially driven decisions. Mm. The primary decision is what is the product features, what is the sales approach to get the revenue right now? And how do we make sure we spend, don't spend the money too quickly given how long it takes to get revenue? So I think most of our decisions, you know, we lay out a financial plan at the start of the year of this is how much we can be spent, this is how much we can basically burn a month. Yeah. As long as we're sticking to that on a day-to-day -day basis, very few of the business decisions are driven by financials. What sources of advice are available for founders around spending and have you made use of any? I think probably other founders. Yeah. Other more experienced founders has been my number one source of advice on spending. Maybe watch some of our investors from like the, the, the seed rounds, I think. Probably because they're more used to the idea that you don't know what you're doing with the cash yet. How, how have you connected to those founders? Either through investors yeah. uh, or founder networks. Like There's two or three really good founder networks in London that I think deliver massive value. Like there's The one I'm part of, founders, I think you're part of ICE as yeah. well. Like there's just probably those are the two that like you can get real value from other founders quite quite quickly yeah yeah i've definitely found like ice to be amazing in terms of connecting to other founders yeah. getting the advice and experience from people who've been there before yeah of the things you've bought for your business which do you remember the most happily it's not really necessarily a thing but it's probably offices mm. you know when you decide to spend an inordinate amount of money on a new office uh -huh. But then you get there, you move the whole team there, and it's like 10 times better than where you were before. Yeah. Or, you know, you. I think those are the things that make the biggest difference to how much people are enjoying work, at least of the, like, the things you like, physical things you're buying. It's like, yeah, I think office is the number one. That's another area that's uh, transformed so much. Definitely. Like when I, the first office I took out 13 years ago was on Putney Bridge. It was such a dump. Like yeah. we were so proud to get it. Yeah. And after getting it, we're like, wow, if we ever bring a customer here, it's going to be really embarrassing. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's so much easier to do it with the platforms that are out there. Yeah. Some of the best spend that we've made has been on training. Mm -hmm. So we've had some great staff training on presentation skills was a really good one with about 20 of us in a room for two days on that. We're doing training at the moment on using co a coaching management style. And this is, it's really cool. For me as the founder, I can go into a room for a couple of days with my team and I'm on an equal footing as everybody. It's not my responsibility to organize yeah, things. Yeah. And so everything being prepared for you is quite a luxury. You have this group experience where the 10 or 20 of you who are together, you leave as different people than you were when you went in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, that, yeah. that's been awesome. 
yeah, coaching has definitely been like, if not the most enjoyable spend, some of the most like valuable spend. Yeah. Like outcome for dollar is pretty damn good. And, and it's really what people want as well. If you look at yeah. the, the modern kind of workforce, the graduates you're getting 23, 25 now, yeah. they play, are placing a real high value on workplaces that can train them and develop them to a different yeah, person. Definitely. As, as like a founder, that's one of the most enjoyable yeah. things I can do is that's see true. that transformation happening. Yeah.